Hello, Pathway Community Church. I'm glad that you're able to join this online service for Pathway Fremont Online. And um, for the first two songs, we're going to be doing One Thing Remains by Jeremy Riddle and At Your Name by Phil Wickham. So it goes like this. Higher than the mountains. Higher than the mountains that I face. Stronger than the power of the grave. Constant in the trial and the change. One thing remains. Your love never fails. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love. Your love And on 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 it goes And it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid one thing remains one thing one thing it remains your love never fails your love never fails never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails never gives up it never runs out on me your love in death in death in life i'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid and there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love in death and in life in death in life i'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love your love never fails your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up it never runs out on me your love your love your love Next song we're going to be doing is At Your Name by Phil Wickham. Mm-hmm. 
At your name. At your name. The mountains shake and crumble. At your name. The oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with Endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O Lord. At your name, at your name. The morning breaks in glory. Jesus, at your name. At your name, creation sings your story, it's all for you, at your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O Lord, Lord of all the earth. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There's no one like our God. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord, Lord of all the earth, one more time. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Thank you.
Thank you, Lord. Um, thank you for everything, God. I, I praise you, Lord, for all the things that you do in our lives, Lord, the, the big things and the small things, Lord. Um, help us to realize all the little details, Lord, that you have your hands in, God, and that you're constantly in control, God. And I pray, Lord, uh, that you would bring healing to, to our land, God, Lord, that we would come to repentance, God, um, for all the things that have been happening, Lord, uh, through the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that you would just melt our hearts, Lord, so that we can love our neighbors as ourselves, God, and that you would show us, Lord, how to be just, God, and how to follow the law as well, God. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just be with Pastor David as he does his sermon and that you would speak through him, Lord, with your spirit, God, and that you would um, align all truth together, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hello to my brothers and sisters on the west coast of the USA. This is Oscar Maru, Nairobi Chapel in Nairobi, Kenya. And I thought to just send you a word of greeting from your brothers and sisters in Christ in this country, a word of encouragement as we have struggled with the reality of the coronavirus and as we have read about how deeply impacted that you have been in the USA. We are a population of about 50 million people. And so far, even though it was expected that it would rapidly spread in our countries in Africa because um, you know, we live in densely populated uh, cities and we have very poor medical facilities, to our surprise, in a population of 50 million, only 2,000 people have been confirmed to have been infected with COVID-19. And of those, only 64 have passed away. And so it's been surprising because we don't know why that is the case and why we haven't been more seriously infected. But as we read about what's going on in the US and in Europe, we have been in prayer for you and I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement. As this thing happened, you know, one of the thoughts that crossed my mind is what do we do? What are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to do in response to this advancing virus? And my thoughts were drawn to a passage in Psalm 11 where David writes, and these are the words of Psalm 11. I'll just read the first couple of verses. He says this, When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then he goes on to say, For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against a string to shoot from the shadow at the upright in heart. You say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains but I will take refuge in the Lord. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. This psalm is a psalm of David written at a time when David was running away from King Saul. He had served King Saul for a short period of time, but Saul did not like him because David became immensely popular in the eyes of the people of Israel. He had won battles. He had gone into battle and won against Goliath. And, and Saul didn't like this. He was afraid that David would overthrow him or alternatively that David would take over from him instead of Jonathan, Saul's son, becoming the next king. And so he determined to remove David and David had to run away. And he fled, you know, away. He went into the mountains. He went to find places to hide. He was struggling with finding enough food. There wasn't enough to drink. And it was a miserable life. And it is out of his circumstances that this question arose. What do the righteous do when your world seems to be falling apart? 
Now, the likelihood is that all of us have a response to that question. Some of us run to, say, the mountain of money. We have a lot of money put aside, and our security is in the resources we have. Others of us don't have a lot of money, but we have good friends, and our security is in a mother or father or maybe a community of friends, and I know that if I go to them, they will care for me, they'll look after me. Or maybe our security is in some good retirement package or some insurance fund, and that's where we look to for salvation when difficulty comes our way. Well, David responds, and he says, two answers to us. And the first of those answers he says, where do the righteous run to or where do they go? What do they do in the time of trouble? And he says, I will take refuge in the Lord. I think what David was saying in effect is, when trouble comes my way, my default response to the trouble, my default response to the hour of need isn't to remember how much I have set aside in the account and I have enough that I can weather any storm or to think of friends who can get me out of a tight spot. David seems to say that when trouble comes, my default response is to go back to God, to go back to God and ask for his help, to go back to God in prayer and ask for his intervention, to go back to God and find rest and peace in the fact of who God is and the fact that I'm his child. I wonder what year mountain could be. Maybe you're one of those who have really good friends and you know that you can run to them as your first response to any trouble that comes your way. I wanna encourage you in this time and in any time when trouble comes, remember God, let him be your refuge. Let him be your default response and not your last response when everything else has failed. And then David says a second thing. Not only will he take refuge in the Lord, but he goes on to say in verse 4, the Lord is in his temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men and his eyes examine them. And what, what David is saying is this. Guys, when trouble comes your way, the throne in heaven is not empty. God has not gone off to sleep. God has not sort of wandered away. His attention wandered away to something else. God hasn't gone to catch the latest Netflix series and isn't watching out. No, 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 no. The throne in heaven, even in the deepest times of trouble, is not vacant. God still sits on the throne and he's watching over you. That's his promise to you and I. Doesn't matter what the trouble is. His promise is that he will never forget you and I and he will always watch over us. This is what Psalm chapter 121 says in verse 3 to verse 8. God will not let your foot slip. He watches over you and will not slumber. Indeed, God who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The psalmist goes on to say, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. And the promise of God that David reminds us is this. God is still sitting on the throne. He is still king. He still reigns and he is still in charge of your circumstances. If trouble has come your way, it has only come because God has allowed it to come your way for some reason. Maybe there's a lesson for it in, in it for you. Maybe he wants to strengthen you and take you through difficult times that will give you fortitude and backbone so that you can stand up again in more difficult times of trouble ahead. God is not asleep. He has not forgotten you. His promise is that he watches over you. I love the principle that Paul talks about in, in the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. And he's talking about what Christ has done for us in verse 3 of chapter 3. And he says, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And for me, the idea of it is, this is my life here. Take my hand. This is my life. And he says, my life is hidden with Christ. And it is hidden in God. It's almost as though I'm at the center of Christ who surrounds me and God who surrounds Christ. 
and I am in a safe place, in a little place where God secures me and keeps me safe. And in this time of the coronavirus, I have determined for my life and my encouragement to our brothers and sisters here in Kenya and to you also is, do not let fear reign. Instead, remember God who sits on the throne and let faith reign in place of fear. I will not be defined by fear about this virus, about catching the illness, about social distancing and making sure that I'm not in the wrong place at the wrong time. I will not be defined by fear. Yes, I will do the right things and I will follow what we've been told to social distance, to cover our mouths and those sorts of things. I will do those things, but I will not be defined by fear. I will be defined by faith in God because my God, because your God is still seated on the throne in heaven. He is still king and he still reigns over you and I. God bless you and do not be fearful. Good morning, Pathway. We've reached the end of June, almost halfway through 2020, and it has been a crazy year, hasn't it? I saw online somewhere that if you take 2020, divide it by five, you get 404 which if you do, do much on websites is the error code for page not found. They're basically saying this whole year is more or less an error code. And sometimes it feels that way, doesn't it? It's just been crazy with the ups and downs and all that's been happening. But I continue to believe that God is in charge. We continue to move forward in hope, in anticipation of the future and what God continues to do. And, and that's what we do each and every day. We continue to worship and we continue to serve and to do what we can. And all we can do really is just to make the most of the time that we have. At this point, we have an opportunity to do something new, so, somewhat, that, that we're calling check-in. And so I created a new page on our website. And this allows you to check in with us to let us know how you're doing. And so you can give us maybe a couple words and share an, an emotion or, or a highlight or whatever it is you want to share. You can also give us your prayer requests. There should be a link on your screen that allows you to go to that page. It should just take a couple minutes. So I would ask you to go on and check in with us and let us know how we're doing. Because we're not all together, it, it can be easy sometimes to, to kind of lo lose track of, of what's going on. We may not be in touch with everything that's going on with you. Although we do, we have been tr you know, doing our best to, to stay in touch. But just let us know how you're doing, how we can pray with you, and our goal is to be as connected and as, as closely knit as possible. And this is basically the same as what we used to do with our blue cards. Just checking in each week, letting us know that you're here, and now this is, this is the digital equivalent. So, so yeah, so go ahead please and, and check in. Last week I shared a joke that McKenna was working on. It was about what you call a silly penguin. And I've gotten some submissions. Here, here's a few of them. Uh, one was a witty waddler. So you could call it silly penguin that. One was a penguin who enrolls in flight school. Yeah, I can see that. And one was a batty bird. So if you do have any of your submissions for what you would call a silly penguin, please let me know. And maybe we could, I don't know, do a competition and, and choose one or something like that. But um, yeah, well, we'll share those with McKenna and let me know if you come up with any. To give an update on reopening, we have been looking at the guidelines and, and what Alameda County has been, has been putting out and what we're able to do. And we were moving forward with the process, given what's been going on with the state and the county, the increases that we're seeing and the spread that's going on. We've put a bit of a pause on that. So our plan is to continue to meet online throughout all of July. And then we'll, we'll reevaluate towards the end of the month and see what September and, the, and what August and the rest of the year will look like. So we do plan to continue our online services in this form, just as we are, throughout the next four weeks at least. And then we, we may, then at that point we'll evaluate. Do we do a blended service live and online? Or do we just continue online? So please pray with us. Along those lines, help us, please pray that we'd have the right wisdom to make the decisions to remain safe and also to maximize our ministry. And please do continue to reach out and continue to get in touch with your friends, with your neighbors, your friends from church, the people who aren't getting out as much. Make sure they're doing okay. And that, that's how we can all push through this together 
and we can all remain on the same page. As we've been going through July, we've been I've been going through June, sorry, we've been looking at the series True, True Peace Requires Justice. And we've been looking at the relationship about peace and justice, how that connects with the racial issues you've been seeing going on. We've gone through Amos. We looked at Amos chapter 5 and how Israel was condemned by God for their role in injustice and discrimination and all that they were doing that fell short of God's standards of worship and holiness. We looked last week at Ephesians chapter 2. And Ephesians chapter 2 details how at the cross, not only were we reconciled with God, we were also reconciled with each other. And the line, the wall, the dividing wall that divided the Jews from the non-Jews was taken down. And it serves a model as how different racial groups can be reconciled and live in unity today. And how we as Christians have been given the power at the cross to facilitate that and that we can live that out and pursue it. So we, we looked at that last week in the relationship between salvation and peace and how salvation is peace. And, and that was our, our topic last week. Today is the final week of that series, so we're finishing that today. And we're looking at a different passage today in Galatians. This is another letter written by Paul. So please turn with me to Galatians chapter uh, 3. Galatians chapter 3. And I'm going to read from verse 23 to verse 29. So Galatians chapter 3, and it says this. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Galatians, as we look at this passage, it's one of the first letters of the Apostle Paul. He wrote it after his first missionary journey when he traveled around the Mediterranean. He'd gone to the church that was in Galatia. And he was writing back to them because of a concern that he had that they were losing the essence of the gospel. It's one of his most it's one of his harshest letters. I think it is the harshest letter. And he writes very strongly, condemning them for losing the essentials of the gospel, the message that had been given to them just a short time before. And they had slipped away from that into something else. And so what had happened, the specific problem, there are people who came in and they argued that to be a Christian, to be a, a faithful and a true Christian, you needed to follow the law. And you needed to be circumcised and live as a Jew. So they're trying to bring back the ethnic restrictions that have been taken down at the cross. They were trying to reimpose them, to keep them up, to keep up that barrier that divided people. That's what they were seeking to do. And Paul writes to condemn that. And he says the true gospel does not require circumcision. He looks at the role of faith and contrasts that with the law. And writes that ultimately we're not saved by what we do, but we're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. Recognizing that He has earned our salvation and given it to us as a free gift. And he writes in this passage and, and, and in other parts of Galatians as well about the purpose of the law. He says the purpose of the law was to guard us. That's the, the language we see in, in this translation in the NIV as I read it. So that word literally means a, a tutor or a guardian, a, a nanny, basically, for boys. Someone who would walk them to school in that time. Someone who would bring them back from school, make sure they were safe. They'd probably help them with after-school homework and you know whatever they were doing to, to keep them occupied and out of trouble until their parents or, or someone else got home. That's what the word literally refers to, someone, someone with that role. And so it's meant to, to teach us. If you think of the law, it's meant to teach us and guide us as we grew in faith using that analogy, until we reached the ministry of Jesus. And once we have the ministry of Jesus, we've reached the completion of the law because Jesus came to fulfill and to finish the law. 
to, to realize the objective it was intended for. So at this point, now that Jesus has come, we don't need a nanny anymore. We don't need an after-school tutor to watch us, but we now are living in the fullness of our faith. And he uses the analogy also of what we're wearing. He talks about how we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So he's given us his robes of righteousness that cover our dirty clothes, our, our filthy, torn garments, the clothes that, that we're wearing that represent our imperfection. But they've been covered by the new clothes that God has given to us. So that's, that's what we have now. So we have a new family. We have a new promise. And we have a new identity. And now we come to verse 28, where I'm going to focus our attention today. And in verse 28, to read that once more, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So he's making a very important statement here. And I want us to reflect on what that means for us. In our day of Black Lives Matter and the protests and the arguments, all the racial discussions that we're seeing going on all around the country right now, what does this verse mean for us? And what does it mean for how we approach these issues and understand the topic of race and what racial reconciliation and and peace looks like? I have three pairs that, that I'm, I'm presenting for us today that I want you to reflect on. And these, these are contrasting ideas that I have for us. And here's the first one. The first one is the idea of belonging versus discrimination. Belonging versus discrimination. And most fundamentally, when you look at this verse, what he's saying is that we no longer have a basis to discriminate. That we no longer to discriminate, that no one is a second-rate citizen because of their gender, because of their color, because of their economic status, or anything else, that, that, that we do not discriminate on this basis, but that we are all one in Christ. We all have value. We all belong. That none of us are excluded. We are all a part of the family. So when we're serving people, when we're doing outreach, when we're ministering, when we're reaching out to to the people around us, if our neighbors are in need of help or anyone else, we have to keep this principle in mind that we all belong, that we all matter to God, and there's no basis on which we should discriminate. My, My hunch would be that it's probably a little easier for many of us to discriminate, whether unconsciously or or more consciously, but discriminating the basis of, of economic status. So if someone looks more affluent or looks more successful, we're probably likely to treat them differently than someone who doesn't. But whatever the case is, this verse clearly tells us that we should not treat people differently because of any of these factors. We must resist this tendency. And remember, as he's saying, that God loves all of us, that salvation is extended to all of us and is open to all. So as we're forming a multiplying community here at Pathway of Christ's followers, as we're following Christ and building community around us, my desire, what we should be doing is building a microcosm of this, a community that does include everyone and that leads us to growth in our faith and and, and, and in our witness to other people, that includes them and, and makes them a part the family. So we see, first of all, belonging versus discrimination. The second, the second pair that I, that I have for us is this, the idea of equal value, but not the same. Equal value, but not the same. And Galatians 3.28, this, this verse, it's, it's a fairly common one. It's one that I'm sure you've seen, you've, you've seen it used in different ways. And, and sometimes I think we, we misunderstand it and we misuse it. And just on face value as you look at it, it, it seems to be saying, when it says we are all one, when it says, you know, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, it, in some ways it seems to be saying that, that we're all the same and, and that there, we don't have differences anymore. Now, obviously, if we think about that very much, we know that that's not true. I mean, just because I became a Christian doesn't mean I'm less male, doesn't mean I'm less of an American, doesn't mean I'm less white. It didn't erase any of those characteristics of myself. So, so what exactly is he saying? And so just as we start with belonging, we see the positive. We see the positive that we have the same value, that all people are made in God's image, that all life is worthwhile. Whatever stage, whatever size, whatever, I mean, no matter what any of those changes may be, that God knows and loves all of us. But at the same time, 
We are not the same. And I don't believe that we should be treated the same because we are different. And I think we have to recognize and be aware of the differences that we have. Even in Christ, we, we, we still have those differences. Those differences are still there and they're still significant. So one way of, of looking at this is contrasting the idea of equality with the idea of equity. And basically equality is, is that everyone be treated the same. That, that it's just, you know, if you have, I don't, I don't know, you know, one dollar, that everyone's given one dollar. If you have five sandwiches, you just give everyone five, one sandwich. I mean, it's just taking something, dividing it up equally, and, and looking at that as, as equality. But there's another concept. It's very similar, but a little bit different. And it's the idea of equity. And the idea of equity is that, that the, more the idea of fairness and the idea of justice. And sometimes to realize true equity, you don't have complete mathematical or exact equality. And sometimes, depending on someone's situation, they need to be treated differently. And if you've ever been in a classroom, you realize that not all students are the same. Some need more help, some need less help. We're all at a different place. We're all at a different place in our journey of faith. We're all at a different place in economically or whatever it might be and so we recognize those differences and we don't use them as the basis to discriminate or to reduce someone's worth but we do recognize that it does mean that they can and should be treated differently just not treated worse and so we have we have those two contrasting ideas the idea of equality that if you if you do it too literally or maybe too I don't know too strictly or too legalistically, you don't end up necessarily with equity. You don't actually achieve justice if if we just make everything the same, and and so it's that recognition of differences. And as a church, it's recognizing that there are people here, the people who worship with us, people who are tuning in right now online, that see the world differently that have different perspectives, that disagree on, on different positions, but that we're able to include that into our family and that we're able to use those differences to make ourselves stronger. One of the great examples of this is spiritual growth. Um, I'm sorry, spiritual gifts. When you look at spiritual gifts, you all have different spiritual gifts. Doesn't mean one is worse, doesn't mean one is better, but they're different and we're strongest when we maximize those gifts by putting them together and, and, and using them to be a larger and a stronger and a, a more um, powerful whole that we're able to become a stronger family when all those gifts are put to work because we all have a different role and a different place, a different position. So some, sometimes, that, you know, I've been reading a lot recently about, about being colorblind. And sometimes we, we hold up the idea of being colorblind as, as the ultimate form of non-racism. And, and I've heard people say, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've come across this, the idea that, you know, I'm not racist because I don't see color. And while this is usually said with very good intentions, it's very well-meaning, and perhaps in one way it does represent a certain ideal that where we are, and, 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 and given, given our, our realities, often the way it can be heard, if I tell someone I don't see color, if, if it is someone of color, what they can often hear is, I don't see you. And, and that feeling is, you know, you're not seeing me, because that, that is a part of who I am. So if you don't see that, what, what is it that you see? You're, you're missing that part. So I think you have to recognize that, well, we should not, um, we should not discriminate on that basis, we have to recognize that it's there. That we can't reduce someone to their color, but we can't also take it away from them. We have to recognize that it is a characteristic. It is something that matters, and it is something that, that does shape how they were made, and we don't want to strip them of that identity. So, so we have to think through how can we demonstrate and show equal value, but not just make everyone the same and not try and have a mold that everyone just fits into that, that then strips away some of their defining characteristics. And then finally, I'm, I'm going to move a little beyond what, what exactly our passage says, but, but give you some final thoughts with, with my last pair. And, and, and the last concept is this. It's the idea of true solidarity and not token representation. When I was a, a student in, in Kenya, 
I, I was studying at a school of theology that was becoming an accredited university. And so they did quite a bit of publicity around this. And for a while, I became somewhat of the poster child. And I was even on the billboard for a little bit that was on the main road leading into the school. And if you look at the billboard, you know, there were, there were four people on, on the billboard, as I remember, and two of them were, were white. And so, you know, you, you, you would think that, uh, there's either four or five, but, but you know, it was about 50% of the billboard that was white. So you might think that about 50% of the students were white, but we were about maybe two or 3% of the students. And, and so they were being very intentional as they did their publicity in highlighting the diversity that they had. And I've seen the same thing just using the opposite majority when, when I was at college here in the U.S. And we were, a, that was a school that was about 90% white. But on all their publicity, they, they do their very best to highlight people of color, so someone who's Asian, someone who's black. And I'm sure you've seen this in, in, in places that do publicity. No, that's not wrong, and I'm not trying to you know, criticize that, that practice. And when diversity is an aspirational value, that's one of the steps that you take in order to get there. But at the same time, we don't want to stop there. And we don't want, no one wants to be the token black guy. No one wants, I don't want to be the token white guy at, at, at a largely black school, and that's all that I am. No one wants to be just the representative of their culture. They don't want to be a token Asian guy or, or girl. And, and so we want to move beyond just the token representation, the, the, the token um, diversity that we can have sometimes, and have true solidarity. And what that means is actually listening to the perspectives that different people have, actually giving them a seat at the table, giving them positions of, of leadership, giving them positions of influence, allowing them to express where they're coming from and how they see the Bible, how they see ministry and, and what God has been doing in their life that could be so different from what I've seen, what I've experienced. So it, it's opening ourselves to the variations in their perspective and in their experience of what God has done. And I think that would go a long way towards building meaningful and true solidarity. So, so we have to be careful that, that you know, as we put together our, our team, as we put together our leadership and all those, that we do seek to give each person, that, that, that we do give each person a, an opportunity to fill those roles and that we don't, whether consciously or, or unconsciously, exclude people because they don't look like the majority. And it's a very tricky thing. It's, it's a very difficult thing. I know here's Pathway, we have a long ways to go in this. And, and I know that we've, I think we've, you know, we've made maybe some steps that, that reflect this, but we, we have a long ways to go. And my desire is to continue to move forward, to continue to see different people who are worshiping with us and different perspectives, different backgrounds that are welcome and that form our community. And to see different, I mean, my, my, I would love to see different languages in our worship. You know, new faces, different faces in the pulpit that are sharing. And, and, and I'm doing what I can to work towards that. And I hope that together we can make progress in that, in that direction. Diversity is a core value for us as a church. It's something that we as a board have looked at over the past year, and we've made it. We've intentionally you know, um, selected that as one of our, of our core values. And we're continuing to see what we can do practically to achieve that. Because as I said, we do have such a, a long ways to go. As I've been putting this together and as I've been reading and reflecting, I've realized there's so much about being a healthy, multiracial, multicultural church that I don't know. And there's so much of those dynamics that I'm not familiar with, that I haven't experienced before. And I hope to grow in that area. And I hope to learn a lot more about what it means to disciple people of, of different races, people of different ethnicities, and what it means to incorporate them into our community. And I hope that we can all be on that journey of, of growth and of, and of understanding. As we, as we move ahead. So this isn't an easy topic. I know, as I mentioned before, this is sensitive for, for many of us. But I do hope that God can lead us in this direction, that we can realize this as a goal, and that we can form a community that is inclusive, that is loving, and that we are holy. We're set apart from the people around us because of our identity in Christ, but not excluded because of our skin or because of those, those other characteristics.
I'm going to close us in prayer, and this is the end of our of our series. We'll, we'll, we'll you know look at new topics in the months ahead. But I hope we can continue to reflect on these issues and continue to read, to learn, and to grow in these areas. And, and that's what I'm sure we'll be revisiting this in future in, in different ways. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing what God is doing in our community. So please pray with me. I'm, I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm going to start with uh, a, a liturgy I found, a prayer for racial healing, and, and then, uh, and then uh, continue in prayer after that. Dear Lord, uh, God of justice, in your wisdom you create all people in your image without exception. Through your goodness, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that all your children are brothers and sisters in the same human family. Open our hearts to repent of racist attitudes, behaviors, and speech which demean others. Open our ears to hear the cries of those wounded by racial discrimination and their passionate appeals for change. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrongs of history and fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds build bridges forgive and be forgiven and establish peace and equality for all in our communities in jesus name we pray amen dear lord i do continue in prayer and i i desire that as a church you would lead us deeper into your will that we'd know more of your desire for us to be a diverse community I pray that we would grow in our faith and that we would grow in our understanding of you, that we become more like you as we move ahead, O oh God. I pray for your blessing upon all those who are watching this, upon all those who, who may be hearing this even after, after the fact, if they access it on, on YouTube or by some other means. And I pray that you would move in our hearts, O oh Lord. I pray if there's anyone listening to this who has not yet found you, that you'd reveal yourself to them and that and that you would draw them closer to yourself, and they may begin their journey of salvation and their journey of faith. I pray for our country. I pray for healing for the wounds that are there. I pray against violence. I pray against looting. I pray that we would not see that anymore in our country. I pray for law and for order, O oh Lord. And I pray that even with all the work that's being done with police forces, with training, with changing of laws, I pray that you'd work in our hearts and that you would um, enable us to live in a community that is loving. I pray that we can see structures that point towards justice as well as peace. And I pray that we can see everyone included, that we would not see extrajudicial killings, we wouldn't see the brutality and violence that we have seen, that that would come to an end. And that is my prayer, that's my desire today. And, and I pray that your will would be done, O oh Lord, on earth as it is in heaven, and that we would embody that, we would live that out, and that you would give us the strength to do that. So I pray that you would strengthen those who are feeling weak, you'd give strength to those who, who need it, O oh God. You'd give energy for those who are tired. You'd lift up the spirits of those who are discouraged. You'd provide for those who are struggling, whether it's financially or otherwise, and that you'd be with, it, be with us. You'd give us your, your, your healing for those who need physical healing, and that you'd lift up our spirits and give us new strength. So guide us, O oh Lord, and I, I look forward to all your blessings and your favor continue to be made manifest in our lives and to be poured out to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor David, for this sermon. Um, uh, I hope that we can take it to heart and apply it to our lives. And, and this is the last, um, last sermon for the series. And so just everything that Pastor David has, has been preaching um, for the past series, that we would just really just meditate on them, go back to the, the previous videos and just really focus in and, and keep, keep lear uh, learning about what, what uh, God has revealed through Pastor David. And um, yeah, so for the last song, we're going to be doing God of Wonders, um, and it's by Third Day. Lord of all creation, Lord of all creation, 
of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory be to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. The Lord of heaven and the earth. Lord of heaven. Lord of heaven and earth. Early in the morning. Early in the morning. I will celebrate the light when I stumble in the darkness I will call your name by night God of wonders beyond our galaxy you are holy declares your majesty you are holy holy Lord of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth Lord of heaven and earth hallelujah hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah. To the Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah. To the Lord of heaven and earth, to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, precious Lord, reveal your heart to me, Father, hold me, hold me, the universe declares your majesty you are holy 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 thank you lord um I pray, Lord, that you would just give us one spirit, God, as, as everything starts to uh, unite again, God, as we begin to think about reopening, God, uh, in the future months, God, that you would uh, unite the church, God, even now, God, before we even come back to the physical church, God, um, that you would make us a church, God, in our hearts, God, and that we would see each other, Lord, as you see us, God that we are forgiven, Lord, we are loved, God, and that you see us as, as you see your Son, that he died for us and he gave us life. He gave us a new new life that we can be seen um, through that eye, those eyes, God. And I, I pray, Lord, that we would just be able to see each other in that same light, God. And so I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>